Hello, I'm Corinna Harrod and this is the Monday Night Review. Hello and welcome to episode 115 of the Monday Night Review. I have a bit of a long one today. Whenever I say that, they then don't record that long. But in terms of length of writing, it is a long one and I didn't want to be rushed when I was recording it. So it's eight o'clock at night. I'm going to be in my office for a couple of hours recording this and then editing it to get it up on Monday. But I didn't want to do it in the middle of the day when my time was going to be squished by school pickup. Just to round off my Britishness, humidity. The rest of the world, what are you doing? We can't, it's, uh, it's, I'm not okay. The humidity is too much. I have a 10-year-old who's cried twice now that he was promised autumn in September and autumn has not come. Uh, He's very happy at the prospect of rain. And I have to say, as I walked into my office, I love the summer evenings. I often walk the dog. Dogs. Don't, Don't just choose one and go with it. In the evening, in the summer. And it's so lovely to just be out at that time of day. I know lots of people like to walk early in the morning and I really appreciate it. But as I am like a drugged manatee in the morning, I don't think I would fully take it in. But there's something about an evening walk that I just love. And I accidentally took the dogs out a bit late the other day. I left at quarter to seven and I came back an hour later and it was pretty dark. I was having to use my phone as a torch. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, the nights are definitely drawing in. And as I just walked into my office, it's the sun has set, it's twilight. And there's something slightly exciting about autumn. I'm a fan. I always say this. I'm a fan of whatever season is about to come. Because by the time autumn comes around, I've usually had enough of summer. By the time winter comes around, I'm ready for it etc. So I ordered loads of books from World of Books for this podcast and one of them is about ghosts and so I think we're going to have to sit and do some spooky recording in here this autumn just to really get us in the mood. But not today. Today is hardcore true crime. You've been warned. Um, We haven't been on the US states for uh, the tour of the US states for some time and so we're doing that today one downside I mean there's probably loads of downsides but one notable downside of me recording at eight o'clock at night is I will not be able to speak so if there's shonky pronunciation shonky editing I'm sorry I'm a one woman show and this this is a long one so we're going to Delaware today. There's a really annoying. I've turned into my mum. My mum, whatever you say, she'll know a song about it that she'll sing in a cheery way. And we laugh about it. But my children don't laugh about it because they're like, that's just what you do, mum. And there's an old song about all the US states. And I never remember it until someone says Delaware. And then I just start singing it. I'm not going to sing it now. I'm going to save save your ear holes for listening to true crime. I don't want to turn you off already. What's really interesting about today is often when I'm looking at the next on my list of US states, and the, the same with the London Tubes to some extent, but with the US states, especially you can imagine California, there's a lot to choose from. But when it comes to Delaware, I'm sure there's loads of hauntings and weird stuff that goes on. And if you know of it, I would love to hear it. But we're going to talk about the man who has the dubious accolade of being Delaware's only serial killer. He's sometimes called the Route 40 killer. He's sometimes called the I-40 killer. He's sometimes called the Corridor killer. We're going to be talking about Stephen Brian Pinnell. My sources today are an incredible Delaware Online article, series of articles by Patricia Tellerico, Esteban Para, and Damien 
Giletto. This I used extensively. Really well researched. And because it's from Delaware, I trusted it a bit more than just random media. Because there were quite a few inconsistencies in the stories that I was using. So I thought I'm going to pick the Delaware one because it's the most in-depth. It's from the area. And then everything else can be filled out from the other things that I've read. I also use Murderpedia, All That's Interesting article by Neil Patmore, Mind Hunter by John Douglas. He's pretty famous, so there's lots of stuff on him everywhere, but it's not very in-depth. We're going to be quite in-depth today. On the rainy night of November the 29th, 1987, Leslie Mahoney and her boyfriend were driving through an industrial park in Newark, Newcastle County, Delaware, looking for somewhere to park. The industrial park near Salem Church Road was under construction and though roadways were in place, few buildings had been erected, making it the perfect place for couples to get some privacy. It was uninhabited. As they were driving around, they saw a mannequin on the side of the road, but something about it made them circle the car back round for another look. And as Karen and George say in My Favourite Murder, it's never a mannequin. If you think you see a mannequin on the side of the road, it's very much not a mannequin. Leslie and her boyfriend had just found the beaten, mutilated and partially clothed body of Shirley A. Ellis lying in the mud just off the side of the road. 23-year-old Shirley Ellis didn't have a car, so was used to hitching rides or getting lifts, and she lived with her mother, stepfather, and other family members in a working-class neighbourhood off Route 40 in Bear, Newcastle County. Having previously been in trouble with the police for sex work, she was looking forward to retraining as a nurse. Ellis was returning from Wilmington Hospital where she'd been delivering a Thanksgiving care package to a friend who was a patient there. At some point, Shirley Ellis accepted a lift from a stranger and he attacked her. Trigger warning. Violence against women. Delaware State Police Detective Joe Swiskey, one of the primary investigators on this whole case, said it was apparent that Ellis had fought her attacker. Defensive wounds were found on her face, hands and knees. She's five foot six inches. She weighed about 168 pounds and she really tried to fight this guy off, but was unable to. Her hands and ankles were bound and she was tortured. Ellis's autopsy revealed that what looked to be pliers had been used to mutilate one of her nipples and left pinching impressions on her stomach and left breast. She'd been strangled with with wire tie, like a zip tie, until she was almost dead and then suffered repeated blows to her head from what looked like a hammer. The deep cylindrical blows visible in her skull are what killed her. Her killer then removed the duct tape from her mouth, wrists and ankles, but a small section was found in her hair, which would prove vital evidence later on in the case. The police were cautious. This was unusual. They didn't release very much information to the public. They believed that this homicide was probably committed by someone she knew. They were aware that she had done sex work before and obviously there's a whole stigmatism around that as to uh, being putting yourself in a vulnerable situation and they were also aware that they didn't want to give too much information away however they spoke to and cleared anyone who could possibly have done this that Ellis knew and within seven months the trail went cold on the 28th of June, 1988, about seven months after the body of Ellis was found, the second victim, 31-year-old Catherine A. DeMauro, was found. DeMauro had spent the afternoon of the 27th at Matthew's Bakery, which is her family business along Route 40. She'd stayed there for four hours and left at about five o'clock in the afternoon, going to a nearby Wendy's for a salad. Distressingly, her mother would catch a glimpse 
of her daughter again. It's about 9 p.m. as she and her husband drove to the to the shops. Demora was standing on the side of Route 40. Her mum said, quote, we looked for her on the way back, but she wasn't there. Demora worked at a lunch wagon on a construction site. She was divorced and her three children lived with her with their father. She did have Kenneth Fowler, who was I don't think he was a friend. I think this was like an early form of sort of Airbnb. He was sleeping on her sofa as a sort of paying guest. And he said that she came home at about 1030 that night and then went out again. And she was last seen by a witness walking down Route 40 at about 11.30 that night. At 6.25 the next morning, construction workers found her naked body sprawled in the dirt of the construction site of Bentley Place. Her right leg was drawn under her body with her foot touching her arm. Red marks wound round her wrists and lower legs and a thicker red mark encircled her neck. Her straight brown hair was massive with blood and heavy blue-black bruises were all around one breast, along with blood from a mutilated nipple. She had, unlike Ellis, dark bruises all over her buttocks and the torture seems to have escalated. Demora was identified by her dental records. Like Ellis, she was killed by hammer blows to the head, having been strangled to almost the point of death. And though her clothes had been completely removed, there was no sign of sexual assault. So Ellis is found with her trousers pulled down, her shirt open, but no sign of sexual assault. I think it's worth noting here that when I say there's no sign of sexual assault, I mean there is no sign of Vaginal or anal interference, I guess, is how you'd put it. I believe that for this culprit, the mutilation and the torture was probably sexually gratifying and in itself, not necessarily the sex act. So although I may say there's no evidence of sexual assault I mean that physically in the vaginal area. A piece of silvery gay duct tape, apparently used to gag her, was still on her scalp like Ellis. But unlike the first victim, her body is completely covered in blue fibres. So from Ellis, the only clue they have is the duct tape trapped in her hair. With Demoro, they have a bit of duct tape, but these tiny blue fibres that are all over her body. And the police know that if they can find the source of the blue fibres, they would at least find where Demoro had been. Demoro's father, Stephen Oshokik, wouldn't talk to anyone after his daughter's brutal death. Instead, he walked for hours. Shokik would die of a heart attack hours before his daughter's mass of Christian burial at Our Lady of Fatima Catholic Church. Demora's mother would say that the stress was too much for him and she would blame her husband's death on the man who killed her daughter, which I think is fair. I think we can count him as an unintended victim. Luckily, Newcastle County Police Detective Sergeant Jim Hedrick recognised the similarities between this case and the one near Newark seven months previously and he called the state police to ask to someone who had worked on the case and he speaks to Joe Swiskey who drives down immediately and they talk about their individual cases and Swiskey agrees that this is a carbon copy of the Ellis victim and the two men team up and I love that in loads of cases we talk about how um even here even in the UK uh police forces don't talk to each other it's better now there are computers um but quite often things would be going on in different areas of the country and the police forces are not sharing information 
this is like the dream team. These guys realize their victims have been through the same thing and they form the dream team. They go through and they look up all missing persons cases and unsolved homicides to see if there are any other cases that could be linked to the same offender. And though they didn't find anything, there's no denying the similarities between the murders of Ellis and DeMauro. And Hendrick decided to call his friend Jim Zott, an FBI agent and profiler. Zott drove to meet the two men and hear about their cases. What he heard was enough for him to consult with John Douglas, creator and manager of the FBI's criminal profiling program. And in July, Swiskey, Hendrick and prosecutors drove to the FBI headquarters in Quantico to present their case. After 90 minutes, the FBI agreed with the officer's gut feeling that they were in fact dealing with a serial killer and this serial killer was therefore likely to strike again. The FBI took photographs of the crime scene, the victims and the police reports and started to build a profile. It's amazing that you can just... I know that um, two murders is terrible, but with just these two murders, the FBI's profile for this guy is bang on. So they... you know, work out that a serial killer is stalking young women with brunette hair. His methods of torture and mutilation were getting progressively more vicious and he wasn't going to stop killing until he was captured. The killer was likely a white male, 25 to 35 years old, lived or worked within a five mile radius of where the bodies were found, was employed in one of the construction trades and would take his tools with him, would drive a van with a high mileage, would cruise excessively looking for women. He'd be involved in a relationship with a woman, but would be abusive or problematic, though he would be emotionally flat during the attacks. He would kill again and again until he was caught. This killer was hiding in plain sight. He wasn't an outsider coming into the area to drop, to pick up women and drop their bodies. The FBI advised the officers to lure the killer out using an undercover female police officer wearing hidden microphones. The female police officers should engage in conversation with prospective Johns, but not get into their vehicles. This seems simple to talk about. Also, for anyone else who is a fan of TJ Hooker, that's basically the show's premise for pretty much every episode. Loved it. Heather Lockyer, I think it was. Was it Heather and TJ Hooker? That was what she did every week. Uh, So it seems really simple to talk about, but getting the right woman for the job was incredibly difficult. This is the 80s in Delaware, quite rural Delaware, and there's not a lot of female police officers anyway. They needed, and also it wasn't going to be one time it was a long-term prospect they needed someone to dress the part look the part speak the part be able to talk about sex prices they needed to be confident talking to men who could potentially be a violent serial killer and after one false start they found 23 year old rookie renee lano who was assigned to the county's uniform patrol unit and had been on the job for only five months. The police were aware that the killer was probably following the media reports. There were no social media at the time. It does have its benefits, but it did mean that he wasn't getting, he was just having to get what was in the papers. And they kept what details were in the papers very vague. And they also didn't want to create widespread panic. You tread the fine line of wanting people to be really careful and vigilant but also creating this sort of mass panic. But what he did read in the media was enough for him to make some changes. Margaret Lynn Finner was a petite 27-year-old brunette, a recovering cocaine addict who'd turned to sex work to pay her outstanding bills. She disappeared on the 22nd of August 1988 and her stepfather Robert Barlow set out to find her immediately. He'd been in her life since she was four And he loved her and her two young children, which she just managed to get back from foster care. She was getting her life 
back on track. Eventually, the family had no choice but to report her missing to the police, but felt that they weren't doing enough. One of Finna's friends had called to say that he'd seen her get into a blue van on Route 13 near Hare's Corner. Over the coming weeks, Barlow would drive up and down, up and down, from 9.30, from 9pm to 3am, just up and down Route 13, in search of any blue van. Any van he saw, he wrote down the registration number, which he then passed on to Jim Hendrick. But the police were acting at least four nights a week. Lano, posing as a sex worker, was walking the areas where Shirley Ellis, Catherine DeMauro and Margaret Finner had last been seen. Lano was the daughter of an FBI agent. She'd been in a close-knit, strict Catholic upbringing and initially had doubts about this assignment. But Hendrick knew her. He'd watched her as a rookie and thought she would be a great fit. It's worth noting that Alana graduated as one of only two women in her graduating class from Newcastle County Police Academy. She wore brown wigs over her naturally blonde hair and changed her makeup, stood in the areas close to where the previous victims had last been seen. She had to be taught how to negotiate prices for sex, which at the time, especially for a Catholic girl, although she was married, would have been awkward. Hendrick and other officers would accompany Lano to the highway and park in hidden areas. While she was off the roadway, Hendrick would monitor her from his unmarked car as other officers continually drove by her in unmarked cars. Eyes would be on her at all times. She had a pager with a microphone and a loaded gun in her bag and was told never to get in a car. By August, she'd spoken to at least 100 men. In fact, she became so good that one night the owner of a diner asked her to leave the parking lot because so many cars stopped to talk to her and it was disrupting his business. All this time, they were looking for Margaret Finner, but there's no sign. However, 19 days after her disappearance, 26-year-old Kathleen Ann Meyer was out walking alone up Route 40 at about 9.30. PM. She just had a fight with her boyfriend, which had turned physical, and she had a bloody nose. An off duty policeman watched Maya, with blood on her face, talk to and then get into a blue van near the entrance of Brookmont Farm. Though he was off duty, he didn't know anything about the case. Something seemed off to him, so he wrote down the license plate number, though he didn't share the information with anyone it would come in useful because the next morning Mayer's boyfriend would report her missing. Kathleen Ann Mayer would never be found. On September the 14th, Lana was once again out undercover with Hendrick around the corner in an unmarked car when a dark blue panelled Ford van with round headlights drove past her slowly. At each pass, he made a U-turn and then come back past her. He did this about seven times in 20 minutes. None of the men that had stopped or talked to her had ever done this before, and it made Lana really uneasy. And she was uneasy enough that for the first time on her wire, she asked Henrik to beep his horn to check that the microphone was still working and he was still nearby, and she was relieved to hear the beep of his horn instantly. She described the driver as he kept driving past her as, quote, a fat guy with a beard and read the license plate number, which Hendrick then radioed in for checking. Hendrick decided they needed a darker area. Maybe the lit up area was putting this guy off. And so Lana moved to the Buckley development at about 11.30 p.m. The blue van appeared once again, driving past, turning and driving back again. And then he pulled over. Lana would later say, quote, my stomach was in my throat. She had seen what this killer had done to the previous victims. She knew potentially what she was talking to. When she started talking to this man, he was sullen and withdrawn. Most men who tried to pick her up were sort of charming and trying to woo her. And this guy 
was hard work. Conversation was stilted. He mumbled. She couldn't hear him properly. And then he said, get in. Lano managed to stall, pretend she hadn't really heard properly, and asked him to switch on the light in the van, which he did. She then noticed that the van's walls were covered in blue carpet. Lano was absolutely horrified. She knew that the Blue Fivers had been covering Kathy DeMauro's body. And she so cleverly said it was a really cool van. And had he done the carpet himself? And she strokes it and she manages to get fibers on her hands and under her nails. And then she puts it in her bag when he's not looking. As they continued to talk, the man told Lana that he was 34 and worked as an electrician. She realised that he was basically ticking off the items on the FBI profile and was absolutely terrified. She managed to persuade him that she was too high for sex and then purposefully walked away from the van. The van sped off immediately, eventually followed by Henrik and Lano who followed him around for a bit and then left him. The results came back on the registration check. It was registered to Stephen Brian Pennell and his wife, Vera Cathy Pennell, known as Cathy. Their mobile home in Glasgow Pines Trailer Park off Route 40 was near the areas where the victims' bodies had been found. Pennell was 30, 6 foot 5 inches and weighed in at 300 pounds. He was described by friends as, quote, a gentle teddy bear, a gentle soul, a man who could not even bear to pull the trigger when accompanying his friend out on a duck hunt. But his love for animals did not necessarily translate to humans. He had few close friends and could often be heard by neighbours shouting abuse at his wife. He had wanted to be a policeman all his life, but failed the medical. Doing pull-ups when you're 300 pounds is difficult and that's what he failed on. It was all he'd ever wanted to be. When he had been young, he'd spent hours talking to a neighbour who was a policeman and he didn't really know what else to do. So he trained as an electrician. He was known to be neat and methodical and his van was his pride and joy. He'd met his wife, Kathy, in, New, in a New Jersey bar and they soon moved in together. He fell out with his parents after Kathy and his mother, who'd never approved of their relationship, had a fight. And so he marries Kathy and they have two daughters together, as well as living with Kathy's daughter from a previous marriage. And they moved to a mobile home in Glasgow Pines Trailer Court. It was a small cul-de-sac secluded by trees. And he's a great dad. He plays games out in the front with his kids. He does homework. He was once Santa Claus at Christmas events. He would drive other people's kids to school and pick them up. He occasionally worked as a bouncer, though he wasn't very successful at it. He wasn't convincing. He wasn't very scary. He didn't really like being the bad guy. Makes you wonder whether he'd actually been a very good policeman at all. He also failed to get steady electrical work. Despite being good at his job, for whatever reason, he was out of work a lot and he ran up credit card bill debts and this sort of financial incompetence put a strain on his relationship with Kathy. In 1987, when Kathy's mother died, they tried to buy her house, but because of his debt, they were unable to and he would later say that she never forgave him for this. Their relationship deteriorated further and that coupled with his insomnia meant he would seek solace in his van driving up and down local roads. After his interaction with Lano, police were still keeping an eye on Pennell and on the evening of the 18th of September, they followed him as he drove the van on his usual circuit of routes 13 and 40. They then followed him back to his home in the Glasgow Pines trailer park, sat outside, watched him go inside and waited until he turned out the lights. Assuming that he'd gone to bed for the night, the police left. But then Pennell went out for a drive. A few miles away, 22-year-old Michelle Gordon was walking out of a bar 
near the Route 1340 split. Michelle, known as Shelley, was born in the UK and moved over to the US when she was four. She dropped out of school, fell in with the wrong crowd and got into drugs. Her little brother would say, quote, She trusted too many people. She was really trustworthy herself, but she trusted too many other people. Gordon, like the other victims, had long brown hair and supported her habit with sex work. The bar she was leaving on the 18th of September had refused to serve her beer, whether because she was too high or because she looked a lot younger than her age. And obviously, I believe even then, the legal drinking age in the US is 21. It's not here. We, we don't know that, but a witness later saw her accepting a six-pack of beer from a man and then getting into a blue van. At around 10.30 in the morning of September the 20th, a truck operator from the Army Corps of Engineers called 911. He'd seen Gordon's nude, mutilated and beaten body washed up on the sharp rocks of the south bank of the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal near Summit Bridge. For Swiskey and Hedrick, this third confirmed victim was a deep blow. They were actively hunting this man and he still managed to commit murder right under their nose. As with the previous victims, the torture had increased with the hammer blows to the buttocks leaving horrible deep bruising. Unlike the other two, however, there's no sign of strangulation or head injury. The coroner believed that the amount of cocaine in her system made Gordon less able to deal with the torture that was inflicted and he died before he could strangle her. And still the police followed Pennell. They watched him drive to the garage and when he left, asked for the detail of what he had done. And it turns out that he'd had all the tyres on his van replaced. The police retrieved all 30 tyres from the tyre bin and sent them off to the FBI to see if they matched the plaster cast of the tyre prints taken at the scene where Catherine de Moro's body was found. Four days after Michelle Gordon's body was found, the FBI called Delaware authorities to confirm that the blue fibres found on the body of de Moro matched those plucked by Rene Lano from Pennell's van. They also found that the two tyres taken from the garage were similar they also found that two tyres taken from the garage were similar in design to the tyre tracks taken from the Demora crime scene. Stephen Brian Pennell was now the prime suspect in the serial murders of Shirley Ellis, Catherine Demora, and Michelle Gordon. He was now under 24-hour police surveillance and suddenly Swiskey, Henrik and Lano had 50 other officers on their team with them. Pennell was tracked by car and helicopter. Philadelphia International Airport was even asked to change the approach of aircraft to keep the airspace over Pennell clear. They wanted to put a recording device in his van, so they waited, because he was a bit of a Dodge driver, and had him pulled over for a real traffic violation, and then, while he was in court, installed, installed the wire in his car. While they did this, the police also took photographs of the inside of the van, noting articles on the dashboard referencing the murder of Shelley Ellis and Catherine de Moro, all the tools that were there, including pliers, duct tape that was there. After another few weeks, Pennell noticed one of the tail cars getting too close, and the next day he decided to clear out his van. The police listening to the tap heard a young girl's voice say, what are you doing, daddy? I'm exploring, was the reply as Pennell found the hidden wire and ripped it out. He now knew he was under investigation and the police had to move. They did a midnight raid on the Pennell's home, taking hair and fluid samples, searching the van, a car, a trailer and two sheds out the back. They found violent porn videos, zip ties and stained foam padding from under the camper van's carpet, which along with the samples from Pennell were sent off for testing. The police by now openly followed Pennell to the shops, to a rock concert and even stood in his home, becoming quite friendly with his family. Pennell even returned the listening device he'd removed from his van. They were all just waiting for what they felt sure would happen when the samples came back. But Robert Barlow, Margaret Lynn Finner's stepfather, was also waiting. Though he'd stopped his own investigation, he was determined to find out where his daughter was. 
and on the 12th of November, 11 weeks after she went missing, a deer hunter found her skeletal remains in the marsh reeds on the south banks of Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, one mile east of the St George's Bridge. The public, unaware that the main suspect was under constant surveillance already, were told that Finna was a victim of a serial killer who had yet to be caught, and that they believed that the missing Kathleen Mayer was, had also met the same fate. On the 18th of November, the hunt for Mayer was officially called off. They believed that she'd probably been dumped into the canal and her body taken away. And then on the 29th of November 1988, exactly one year to the day after the murder of Shirley Ellis, police swarmed Stephen Brian Pennell's house and he was arrested and charged with the first degree murder of Catherine de Moro, one of the five women whom they believe he abducted, bound, tortured and mutilated. Pennell said to the arresting officer, quote, well, I guess it's time. And the police officer replied, I guess so. Within days, he would also be charged with the first-degree murders of Shirley Ellis and Michelle Gordon. Pennell accepted his right not to speak and never offered anything in a way of motive. He never answered any questions. Swiskey and Henrik still worked the case. Their man was caught, but they needed evidence. They needed to get as much proof as possible and link him to the murder of Finna and the suspected murder of Mare. They found out that he had bought the blue van just 26 days before De Moro was tortured in it. They had the fibres from the blue carpet, the duct tape that matched the samples found on Ellis and De Moro, but they couldn't find the original van that he'd used. He'd obviously used a separate van for the murder of Shirley Ellis, and they were never able to track this down. Though frustrated when they couldn't find the evidence they wanted, Henrik and Swiskey were about to be helped by a whole new breakthrough in legal cases, DNA. The prosecution managed to get a Chicago fibres expert to match the fibres on Kathy DeMauro's body to the fibres in the van. Prosecutor Kathleen Jennings, who fitted the description of Pennell's victims except slightly older, made sure that she got under his skin in court, as advised by the FBI Behavioural Science Unit. She sounds like a real badass. I think she took this very personally, that she fitted the description of his victims and that she was now in a position of control and power. All of these murders the duct taping of the wrists and ankles and the torture is all to do with control and power. And she knew that for her to look like she did and be in control in a position of power in the court would drive him bonkers. And they, the FBI knew that this docile father who would just come across as quiet and unassuming and have people describe him as a gentle giant they needed the jury to see a flash of this violent serial killer that they knew him to be. And so Jennings needed to show the jury what they were dealing with. And it worked. He clearly hated her. And though he remained expressionless a lot of the time, he'd smile and raise an eyebrow to his wife and parents in the front row when he left the courtroom. And he ha is described as having eyes like a shark. I, I'm I'm quite fond of sharks. I don't want to be in the water with them, but I, I feel they're hard done by. But, you know, that black, soulless look. The interior of his van was reconstructed in the court for the jury to see. Experts testified that the DNA tests on bloodstains inside Pennell's van indicated they almost certainly came from DeMauro and hair matched Gordon's. Tool mark experts matched pliers and hammers found in Pennell's van to marks found on the victim's bodies as the juries looked at the horrible post-mortem pictures of the women and their injuries. The FBI's John Douglas took the stand to testify as to how the slayings were obviously linked and therefore one could assume that whoever had committed one had committed all. Jurors were then loaded into a school bus and taken not only to the scenes where the bodies had been found, but also to Pennell's home so that they could see the close, close proximity of all the locations. I can't remember which murderer it was. It is one we've covered. Um, is it one of the Zodiacs? It could be one of the Zodiac uh, suspects. 
where if you drew lines out f- from his home to where all the victims were found, it forms a circle. So it was really important for them to see that they've heard from the FBI profiler who's going to give them the profile of this killer. And then they'll see that Pinnell lives very close to where all the victims were taken and found. When Pinnell took the stand, he appeared cold and aloof. He admitted to picking up sex workers on the Route 1340 area, including Catherine DeMora and Michelle Gordon, but denied meeting or knowing Shirley A. Ellis and r- maintained his innocence throughout. After eight weeks of trial, 126 witnesses and 283 pieces of evidence, it was time for the jury to go away and deliberate. And it wasn't the quick return that was expected. Lots of people thought it was going to be an open and shut case. They took over six days, a state record at the time, not sure if it still is, and on the 23rd of November 1989, Thanksgiving, and one day after Pennell's 32nd birthday, they returned with a verdict of guilty for the murder of Shirley Ellis and Catherine DeMauro. The judge had to declare a mistrial in respect of the murder of Shelley Gordon as the jury couldn't unanimously agree, and they also couldn't unanimously agree on the death penalty. Pennell went to prison and returned to court in 1991, re-indicted in the Gordon case and indicted in the Mayer murder. A DNA test on a blood stain found in the van during the 1989 trial showed conclusively that it came from Mayer and Pennell told the judge that he'd plead no contest to the murders of Gordon and Mayer if the state promised to execute him with 40, within 48 hours. He was told there was no way they'd be able to match that deadline. And in October, representing himself, Pennell pleaded no contest anyway. He begged for the death penalty. He said he didn't want his family to suffer anymore, even though he was innocent. And was granted his wish on the 14th of March 1992, becoming the first execution in Delaware in 42 years. And I believe the first by lethal injection. In a last-minute interview with the press, he maintained his innocence and refused to say what he'd done with Mayer's body. Henrik and Swiski hoped until the end that he would suddenly tell them where Mayer's body was, but he didn't. Pennell asked for the judge to order Kathleen Jennings to be present at his execution, which I think is really telling of what an asshole he is, but also how under his skin she'd got. Uh, the judge refused, rightfully, and Jennings didn't attend. Police officer Lano was in attendance. Since her first meeting with Pennell, she had suffered from nightmares, where he escaped from prison and came for her. She had been married at the start of the case. She was divorced at the time of his execution and she actually it sounds like she wasn't in a good marriage she says the one good thing that Pennell did was show her that she had settled for a loveless marriage and she did go on to marry happily and have two children and she'd actually had really serious health implications from stress she needed to see him die for closure and I believe it worked. A slightly weird postscript to the whole story was that the police received a call, well Swiski, a couple of years after the execution and it was Kathy Pennell asking if the police still had her husband's van. Her kid was learning to drive and she needed something for them to learn to drive on. Despite it, she, her being at the trial, seeing the reconstruction of the van interior and hearing everything that went on in there, seeing Jennings in there kind of reenacting what the women must have gone through, she still wanted the car back to teach her kid to learn to drive and it was still in evidence. So they said, yeah, sure, come and get it. And she did. The trial of Stephen Brian Pennell was the first time Delaware used DNA evidence to obtain a conviction, and this case would also lead to the development of their own homicide unit. The body of Kathleen Mayer has never been found. 
Former Delaware State Police Superintendent Colonel Clifford M. Graviet, by then an 18-year-old veteran of the force, would later say of the hunt for the only known serial killer in Delaware's history, quote, the most chilling of any investigation I've been involved with in my entire career. Kathleen Jennings said, quote, it's a case I'll never forget. It was the most challenging case to prove. It was emotionally difficult. I still think about those women. I do. I mean, look, it's everyone's nightmare. Some strangers. You're completely helpless and you're bound. And this is only going to end with your death. And that is the horrible story of Stephen Brian Pennell, the I-40 killer. I always say I hope you enjoyed that episode. It always seems a bit... I mean, one day maybe I'll get better with words. It's a horrible story. I really feel, I mean, I always think there's that quote that everyone loves. And if everyone loves something, it makes me not love it. But it's true. Look for the helpers. And I think in this, it's a really good example of people doing things right to police officers who could have wanted to solve this on their own teamed up and solved it together two women put them their safety on the line uh Renee Lano and Kathleen Jennings had he I mean would have been terrible but had he got off Jennings would have definitely been in in deep trouble um but they did it anyway, and they did it for these women who couldn't do it for themselves. And I think that's worth noting. As always, I love to hear from you. You can send me an email, themondaynightreview at gmail.com. You can buy me a coffee. You can check out my reading list. You can buy yourself a Monday Night Review t-shirt. And I don't mind saying, but my husband's favourite t-shirt that he owns is a grey pink pod dog t-shirt. So if you are someone who's thinking about Christmas already, I don't want to be that person. But I am being that person. Because realistically, you could start now and tick people off the list and have December just listening to Bing Crosby. I'm just throwing it out there. You can check out the merch. There's a link below. You can find me on social media at the Monday Night Review pretty much everywhere. And as I told the Patreon listeners in their mini-sode, you should join the Patreon and get a mini-sode and get a discount on your merch and all of that. I really like haunted photos and it's bothered me for, I mean, how long we've been doing this? A year and a half that it's very difficult to do a podcast on haunted photos when people can't see the photo. I've just shared it on my social media and I'm overthinking this. So if that's the sort of thing you like to see, go and have a look. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok. I'm there where the kids are. I'm not on Snapchat. I draw the line. I draw the line. I draw the line at threads. Don't try and feel like you're sticking two fingers up to Musk by hopping on Zuckerberg's threads. Don't get me started. Until next time, be kind, stay safe, and always check the back seat before you drive.